Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. Amen. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, I'm sure many of you recognize this from the first line of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. If you have kids, you'll most likely learn it in school. The Gettysburg Address was given after a horrific, brutal, bloody battle in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Among the cause of conflict and the oppression of people, the tragedy of terror and blind greed, Lincoln speech was not the headline of that day, or at least it wasn't supposed to be. What he was trying to do with his speech, which was merely two minutes, was to rally the masses. He wasn't trying to perpetuate the conflict through war, nor was he trying to inspire the North to stay strong against the oppression of the South. What he was trying to do was speak to the hearts and minds of all people. <coughs> to Northerners and Southerners, to men and women, to civilian and soldier, to freemen and slave. What he wanted to do was he wanted everyone to remember what the foundations of this nation were built on. The rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Lincoln's speech was iconic. It was there to inspire preservation through all who dwelled within the Union. Yet, it was in, 18, in August of 1866 when President Andrew Jackson actually declared the end to war. An end which, which Lincoln never got to see because he was assassinated before that. And through that declaration, yes, there was a ceasefire and an end to conflict, but it didn't end hatred. It didn't end racism. It didn't end oppression. It didn't end slavery. Nor did it deliver a perfect, complete, everlasting liberty for all. No, that, that type of liberty, that type of victory came long before a declaration over a century and a half ago. That declaration came by another man, another man who gave another iconic, unbelievable proclamation to people. And that unbelievable proclamation to people isn't just for those who dwell within the Union or the United States of America. It's for all people, everyone. And that proclamation is that we possess, we have the greatest liberty ever known. Friends, please rise and let's take a look at the gospel lesson from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. This is what God says there. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of I, the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. After Jesus' baptism, he was immediately taken into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, where he went without food, water, shelter, rest, or companionship for 40 days. And along with that, he was also tempted. 
He had direct, direct attacks from Satan himself, testing him with every form of trial you could possibly imagine. But after he succeeded, Jesus left. He left and he healed many. He preached to many. He taught the word of God and then, and then he returned. He returned to his hometown of Nazareth. Nazareth, which wasn't that large, maybe a few hundred people, but it was the home of his mother Mary, and it was his, his home as well. It was the place where he grew in the eyes of God and men. Now, like always, it was Jesus' custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, which was Saturday for the Jews, and began on sundown on Friday, or what we would consider Friday, and went to sundown on Saturday, what we would consider Saturday. But on this particular Sabbath day, it was a little bit different because something was asked of him. Now, we don't necessarily know if it was because the reputation about him spread from Galilee to Nazareth or if it just so happened to be his turn in the synagogue that day to stand up as a rabbi and proclaim the word to people. Either way, he was handed a scroll by the attendant. A scroll was a... a a piece of papyri that was rolled up, it was massive, about that big or larger, depending on which book it was, and it had sticks that held it together. And you set one end down, and then you roll out the rest. And you opened up to the exact spot of the text before us from Isaiah, and he announces the word to them. Now, a, a brief note about the synagogue. Synagogue um, is an awful lot like what we do here. Believe it or not. In fact, our liturgical customs, the way we worship, come from synagogue worship. You probably didn't know that, did you? Some of you did. Some of you probably did. But the Sabbath day was a day of worship. A day where people, if they were not in Jerusalem, gathered in the local synagogue of their area. Their synagogue service involved the singing of psalms and hymns. It involved prayers for the people, on behalf of the people, for the nation of the people, and for the nations of the world. It involved a reading from one of the five books of Moses, along with a reading from one of the prophets. Now, the person that was asked to read for that day was also asked to preach a sermon or elaborate on the reading that they just announced. And that typically began when the person went back to their seat to sit down. The setup of that church was similar to this, but, but not necessarily. It involved slabs of stone that surrounded a center aisle. And in the center aisle, there was a podium or a platform where the word was read. Now Jesus, Jesus rolls up this scroll of Isaiah that he just got done reading. He hands it back to the attendant, and he goes and he sits down he conducts his sermon. Now you remember the contents of that sermon, right? He said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Talk about a short church service. That's probably the shortest sermon ever heard in the history of the world. Today, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus just got done reading Isaiah, who proclaimed the work of the Messiah to the people of Israel. And after he hands the scroll back and he sits down, he announces this message. Essentially, what he's doing is pointing to himself. The equivalent would be a comedian or a public speaker or some figure some motivational speaker making some massive declaration and then boom, dropping the mic. We can even see Jesus in this dropping the mic in this synagogue in front of these people. Jesus is plainly telling them that everything you heard about me in that report that came from Galilee or has been circulated through the area is absolutely true. The 
The voice of the Father was heard by the masses that went out announcing him that I am the Messiah that Isaiah proclaimed. Indeed, the Spirit of God descended from heaven and landed on me and has anointed me to preach the gospel to all people. The eyes and the ears of many bore witness to this truth. And the account spread boldly and wildly throughout the area of Galilee. Jesus is the one Isaiah proclaimed, who came to enrich the lives of the poor in heart. Enrich their lives through, through the pearl of the gospel. He's the chosen one sent by the Father, full of grace and truth, to bring release to those held in chains, in, in chains of sin through the deceptions of the devil and the hatred of the world. Jesus is the anointed Son of God who came to bring that kingdom of heaven before all eyes of all people who are slaves to their iniquities and trapped in darkness. Now, friends, you might be thinking, <laughs> that sounds awesome. But I don't ever remember having shackles on. So what does that necessarily mean for me? Well, friends, perhaps, perhaps you've felt deprived of joy lately. Maybe that's, that's due to feelings of guilt that you have because you seem to be in this discontented slump in your life. Or, or, or maybe it's due to the poverty you experience because of the snide comments that you and I make towards others because they seem to have a better life than we do. You see, it doesn't necessarily matter where you're at right now. All of us tend to fall into these, these spouts of impoverished love and, and vain affection towards others. In fact, Many times this week, perhaps you may have felt a little bankrupt in your faithfulness and your devotion to Christ. Or perhaps you may have felt penniless when it comes to, to handing your prayers and requests over to the Spirit to, the, to assault the throne of God with them. You see, we get caught, we get caught up with the pressures of life that we tend to walk around blind to just how far we sink down into moments of bitterness and moments of impatience. We become enraged by anyone and anything that bothers us and, and we become ensnared and oppressed by, by this insurmountable weight of the pressure of the world that we feel is on our shoulders. And the words that are recorded here for us in Jesus about his work of, of releasing the poor and giving sight to the blind and, and breaking the shackles of the slaves and the captives, that message of hope should bring comfort to our ears and streams of tears should run down our face from joy. But unfortunately, sometimes it makes us feel callous and hardened and cold because we just don't see it. We just don't, we don't feel it. And friends, it, instead, of, instead of looking down, instead of looking to others, and instead of looking inward to yourselves for that freedom, Look to him. Look to Jesus and see that he's right there next to you. He's waving you over to behold what he's doing right now at this very moment as your eyes wander from side to side and then back to me. 
He's pointing you to what he's doing in your life. He's sitting next to you in the car or at home. He's shouting at the rooftops in your life to declare to you how much he really loves you. He's right there before your faces with his hand on each side. And he's removing the blinders. He's wiping the gunk out of your eyes. And he's grabbing you by the chin like a loving father does to his child. And he lifts your gaze to him. To see his smiling face and to see how his favor, the favor of the Messiah, looks in your life. That's what his message was about. He came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Jews of Nazareth would have picked up on this right away because they would have tied it in with that celebration of Jubilee. You see, the year of Jubilee happened every once in a while. It, it, it happened where all the accounts were settled. What that means is, is, is that those who sold themselves into slavery because they couldn't take care of themselves anymore were released. That those who gave away their property or had their property purchased right from under them by someone outside of the family had their debt canceled and their property was returned. Sins were forgiven by the grace of God through the shedding of blood and oh, Oh, how joyous that year was for those people. To have a home again. To have freedom once more. To be at peace. Peace with God and peace with people. And friends, that, that year of favor is yours too. Yet it's not just a favorable year. It's also a favorable life. It's a favorable life because you and I get to stand at home in the presence of God. Jesus, friends, Jesus is your Messiah. He's your Savior. He's the one who came to give you and me the greatest liberty we've ever known. That liberty is freedom. Not freedom from, from necessarily dealing with poverty of the flesh, but poverty of the spirit. Freedom that releases us from captivity to sin. Freedom that gives us access to God. Freedom that gives us a clear conscience. Freedom that gives us everlasting eternal life. Freedom that makes us truly free indeed. Freedom that doesn't just give us a pursuit of happiness, but gives us true and perfect joy. That freedom came through the liberty that you and I possess. Friends, it, it, it's not just rumors that we hear. It's not just words that are announced. It's the freedom that we experience in our lives through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and His love on us. You and I, we're, we're first-hand witnesses. We're first-hand witnesses to the, to the cells of captivity, to hopelessness, being swung open, and you and I being led out of them to walk on paths of peace in His name. You and I can look down and see that the shock collars of sin had been removed, that the shackles of Satan's tyranny had been ripped off, that you and I don't just stand as mere listeners of this freedom, but possessors of this liberty. You and I aren't just among those who hear and see the liberty bell in the world. We're inheritors of the greatest liberty ever known. That liberty, friends, 
is built on the promises and work of the anointed Son of God. It's the liberty that gives us the opportunity to come to God's house, not just as a custom, but as a privilege, as a gift, as an act of service. Service where, where you and I, we get to sing praises to God at the top of our lungs as loud as you want, no matter if you're a good singer or not, whether you're a bass or a soprano or a tenor or an alto, or whether you just sing to the radio in the shower, you get to sing praises to Jesus as loud and as joyous and as animated as you want, because that's the privilege God gives you and me. And he doesn't care how you feel about your voice. He wants to hear it. And he invites us to. It's a gift that you and I get to come to in his house and hear his words of promise, those words of comfort, those words of joy, and take them home and revel in them and bathe in them and clothe ourselves in them and absorb them. Because those words, those words rip us from the gutter of despair, pull us from the poverty of the poison of sin, and hold us in the hand of a loving and just God who came to give us life, who came to give us liberty. You and I get the opportunity to come to God's house and to see how he intimately and personally fulfills each and every one of those promises in your life, in every stage of your life. Friends, rejoice! Rejoice with me, because Christ's glory shines forth. It shines forth through the liberty that we possess. Because that liberty is the greatest liberty ever known. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding guards our hearts and our minds with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.